We're also ex- uh, excited to be to the climax, to the, to the ending of the Gospel of Mark, the Jesus story, the way Mark has told it. If you'll remember, we are on Thursday night, Friday morning. It's probably by morning by now. The sun may be coming up by now. Jesus has been through an all-nighter. He's probably not had any sleep. The disciples slept. They fell asleep when he asked them to pray. Betrayed, arrested before Pilate, who uh, first the, uh, the high priest who sent him to Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod. He was tried there. Herod sent him back to Pilate. And it, last week we looked at in Mark chapter 15, basically Pilate as the Roman authority over that area is done with him. And uh, he offers to, as a sign of amnesty and goodwill to the Jewish people, he does this every year, he says, I will release one prisoner to you. And they scream, they want Barabbas, the convicted murderer, and to crucify Jesus. So Pilate has no, really no choice. The crowds have been stirred to demand his crucifixion. And they're at the end of Jesus, almost at the end of Jesus' earthly life, fully God, fully human. Pilate sends him away not to see him again alive. In this message today entitled, um, Say Something, Do Something, we're going to see in five verses what Uh, the people in the story do, and what Jesus does. You've heard the phrase, see something, say something. This is similar to that. But in this situation, say something, do something. And that's Jesus that we're talking about. So we're going to read just the five verses. As I read this, uh, soak in what's happening. They uh, they have left the private residence uh, of Pilate. It's a mansion. It's part of a military complex that Rome has set up in Jerusalem to keep the peace there. When we go to Israel uh, in March, I think Dwight told us we're going to go very near there, walk these roads. The actual same stone steps on the south, what's left of the south part of the temple. The same steps that Jesus walked on, we're going to walk on. So this is part of a big uh, complex that included Pilate's private residence, his judicial chambers, but it also included like a military barracks and a military uh, area that's called the Praetorium. And so Roman soldiers are garrisoned there. That's where we pick up the story. Pilate is done, and they've turned Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. It's in Mark chapter 15, beginning of verse 16. I'm reading from the New International. If you want to read along, please do that. If not, just maybe even close your eyes and picture this. He has been beaten and flogged. Probably the flesh on his back has been ribboned down to his muscles and maybe even his bones. Um, And now they've turned him over to the soldiers to do what they have to do. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put, on, they put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. It's early morning. They leave the praetorium. 
They walked the Via Della Rosa to Golgotha to kill him. In this picture, in this room with these soldiers, there's no Mary, there's no Peter, John is not there, all the disciples. As Steve told us, they scattered. And out he goes. So in your mind, we got two things here. We're going to look at what these soldiers, that's the only other people in the story, and what Jesus did. Here's what the soldiers did. Here's what Jesus did. Okay. First, what did the soldiers do? If I had you now after reading that or heard that read, can you list what they did? We're going to do that. They led Jesus away. Think about that. Jesus is not leading Peter and James and John. He's not leading a band of disciples. He's not leading a woman away from the moment she was almost stoned to death. He's not leading the widow from Nain. He's not leading her resurrected son. Jesus is not leading anyone. The soldiers are leading him. A purple robe. Why purple? A couple of reasons. It represents royalty or power. When you became a, according to several of the commentaries that I've studied this last, read this last week, you became a Roman centurion, a Roman Uh, especially the officers, you were given a a red mantle. It was a piece of heavy cloth, and you wore it over your shoulder to signify who you were and that you were in charge. But over time, that that cloth would fade. Like it it would, would, you know, if you put something in the window, it's going to be a different color than the ones that are not in the window. And one of the other gospel writers says it was a scarlet robe, and skeptics say, well, see there, the Bible's not accurate because one says purple, one says scarlet. But in reality, between purple and scarlet, if you kind of move those colors together, some people are going to say, well, that's purple. Well, that's a dark red, kind of a dark scarlet. No, it's purple. Especially if they had grabbed one of those mantles from the garrison, from the praetorium, and that's what they put on him. Makes sense. You've been with people. What color is that? Green. No, that's gray. No, it's green. They twisted a crown of thorns. And they set, other versions say, pressed. I went out yesterday in the woods behind the house and found a locust tree. How many of you have seen these? How many of you have felt these? Mark, have you ever run into these almost into your eye? Top of your head. How many times has the locust tree attacked you? Too many to count. If you've ever run into these or stepped on one of these, or uh, me mowing on the John Deere, turning close to get close to the tree and you're not paying attention, if this goes in your hand, or in Mark's case, face, it's painful. I don't know what about them. I mean, it, 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 I mean, this is heavy. Um, it's you know that's what goes into your skin. They had woven these, and so now, from the punctures, blood is just oozing, not just from his back and his chest from being flogged. It's now oozing from his head. You know how it is when you have a cut on your head; it bleeds like crazy. It's a lot of blood vessels. Arteries in your head. And now blood is just running down his face. What else did they do? Start mocking him. Laughing at him that he said he was a king and look at you. They struck him. And Mark records, not just once. Again and again. And again, and not just with their 
open hand or their fist. They struck him with a staff or a club in his head. What else did they do? They spit on him. You think you're so good? You call yourself the king of the Jews? You thought you were going to do something? and You thought your life matters? What else did they do? They mocked him. Remember when you were little? People mocked you and made fun of you. There's physical pain and then there's emotional pain. Jesus felt both. When you were nine years old, maybe you're on the school bus, maybe you're on a playground, maybe you're with your cousins. They kind of ganged up on you. And it was only words. But words are painful. Foster kids probably know both kinds of pain. And for some of those kids, I could never express to them, I understand what that feels like. But no matter what they go through, no matter what you go through, Jesus can say to you, I understand. I know what it feels like. What else did they do to him? The purple scarlet robe which they'd wrapped around him and soaked up his blood is now stuck to his skin. I don't know if they were there 10 minutes or an hour or five hours, but now they've ripped that off opening those wounds again. Look at all they did to him. And then they led him again. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords is being sadistically murdered, led now to a place called the Skull. It was the place where the Romans crucified many and they just threw their bodies in a refuge dump, really, a garbage dump, and burned them. If they took them down from the cross at all. Sometimes they left them up there just to rot and they, the birds would just eat their flesh. That's why Pilate was surprised that in the, in the next story or two, he's surprised that Jesus is dead so quickly. Well, that's what the soldiers did. What did Jesus do? Okay. What would you put on that list? What did Jesus do? That's it right there. He didn't do anything. Or did he? I'm going to close our message today from Isaiah chapter 53. It's 12 verses. It was written about 700 years before Jesus by the prophet Isaiah. He was a Jewish prophet, part of Israel's line of prophets. And I propose to you as I read this, you listen to what Jesus is doing. On the surface, it looks like he's doing nothing. It looks like the things that are happening are all led by the soldiers. And on the surface, that's true. And that's a picture of our lives. On the surface, you're going to work. You're in relationships. You're paying bills. You're having disagreements. You're, you're winning games. You're having define this relationship talks with a girl or a boy. You're going to a funeral. You are stressed out because of what am I going to do and how should I do this? All these things that are going through your life, they're things that are happening on the surface. And down underneath, God is doing things. Jesus is doing things. 
that no one can see. And maybe not even you knowing it at the moment. What was Jesus doing? What did Jesus do? Isaiah 54. Excuse me. Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was so despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And the, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. In these moments of where we've been on Thursday and now Friday, and him walking to the cross, Jesus accomplished more in these hours than any other human being. But if you read the account, of these moments, you might get the impression that he didn't do anything. Nobody's taking Jesus' life according to John chapter 10. He's letting them. 
He's allowing all this. This was preordained. This is part of God's plan. This, none of this surprised God the Father, the Son, or the Spirit. He let them. I really believe you. You would have let me do that, wouldn't you? You're weirder than I thought. <laughs> you, you would have let Lynn do that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Why did Jesus do that? The Bible says, For the joy set before him, he scorned all of that. That's out of Hebrews. Let me read it rather than misquote it. Um, there was something that was motivating him to allow this to happen. There was something underneath. There was a story underneath a story, and there's even a story under that. The soldiers were busy. It looked like Jesus wasn't doing anything. But he accomplished for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. If we could be good enough, if we could attend church or make good moral choices, avoid sin, memorize some scripture, go on a mission project, you know, send Coyote Hill $1,000 a month, whatever it is, if we could be good enough to be our own savior, then Jesus wouldn't have to go to the cross he wouldn't have had to allow them to do that but you can't save yourself we are not our own saviors so there was something in him there was a love in him that that the bible describes as for the joy set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What's the joy that motivated this? Greater love has no man that he would lay down his life for his friend. What's the joy in front of Jesus that he can see? You. That's what he could see. He would rather endure this pain for a few hours in the human part of him than to watch you go to hell without an opportunity for life. You are his joy. The Bible says we are his prize. We are his inheritance. So you're the joy. It doesn't look like Jesus is doing a whole lot. But he's accomplishing more in these hours than any other human. So the question is now before you. What will you do in response to a love that great? What will you do with your life? How do we respond to somebody loving us that much? My hope is that we respond, first of all, to his call to forgiveness, to repent, the Bible says. We have all, that passage, we have all gone astray. But he calls us back that we would confess that we're sinners, that we can't save ourselves. I agree, God, I... I have tried, and now I have come to the conclusion, I can't do this alone. I can't save myself. And we throw ourselves at the mercy of Jesus, who says, if you're burdened, if you're pressed down, if you're heavy laden, if you can't make it, come to me, and I will give you rest. And he comes into our lives. We have been ransomed, and here's the part of the payment. We've been bought back from sin and death. So what will you do with Jesus? Because it doesn't look like he was doing much. 